As usual in 2022, Airshow staff was recording all the action at EAA AirVenture in Oshkosh. This is our look back at the most memorable arrivals, departures and aerial performances throughout the week. One of this year's major themes was the 75th anniversary of the United States Air Force and numerous active aircraft types participated in the flying displays. Several types performed one-off flybys, while the F-35A flew a mix of demonstrations and heritage flights. Alongside the regular Warbird showcases, this year's show focused particularly on naval fighters. Among the highlights, a spectacular Sea Fury solo display and a four-ship Flight of the Cats segment, featuring a Wildcat, Hellcat, Bearcat and Tiger Cat. The modern US Navy put in a strong showing, with displays by Growlers, E-2s and F-35s, including four-ship legacy flights. The future of aviation was represented by the state-of-the-art A330neo and a 777 Sustainable Aviation Demonstrator. They were joined by the prototype Blackfly, Electric Eel and Experimental Pearl and Two. Meanwhile, the Polaris Dawn program provided one of the most memorable displays of the airshow season. Their MiG-29 flying with three L-39s and a pair of Alpha jets. This program was recorded by Airshow Stuff and compiled by This Is Flight. If you want to see more of the individual aircraft and performances without added narration, you can find dozens of videos on the Airshow Stuff YouTube channel. And for more Airshow documentary films in this style, visit This Is Flight, where you'll find more than 30 episodes of Airshow Dispatches, each featuring a different event, recorded right around the world. But first, enjoy the highlights of AirVenture 2022. We start with the arrival of the F-35 demo team, along with a trio of Mustangs used by the Heritage Flight Foundation. As is customary for fast jet arrivals at AirVenture, the aircraft performed several missed approaches before touching down. Arriving shortly afterwards, flown by Heritage Flight pilot Charlie Tuner Hainline, was a CF-5D Freedom Fighter. Also known as the CF-116D, the CF-5D is a two-seat training version of the F-5 built in Canada and fitted with the same cockpit and canopy as a T-38. And here is a T-38 from the 469th Flying Training Squadron at Shepard AFB in Texas. This special paint scheme commemorates the squadron's role in the Vietnam War, then flying F-105s and F-4s. Another star arrival was this C-5M Galaxy from Travis AFB. Travis is the largest base of the US Air Force's Air Mobility Command, home to 26 C-5s, along with a smaller number of KC-10s and C-17s. That accounts for around half of the US Air Force's total fleet of galaxies. Yeah, 
Not all aircraft arrive individually. Some gather at nearby airports and make their way to Oshkosh en masse. Most of the aircraft taking part in this segment are ex-military trainers, the likes of the T-6, T-28 and, in this case, 16 T-34 Mentors performing an impressive 16-ship missing man flypast. There was a strong naval theme at this year's air venture, despite the US Air Force anniversary. One of the highlights was the flight of the cats. This four-ship sequence saw an F7F3P Tiger Cat leading an F8F2 Bear Cat, an F6F5 Hellcat and an F4F3 Wildcat, the only Dash 3 model Wildcat still flying. The Wildcat entered service in 1940, but only three years later, the Hellcat was introduced as its successor. This Hellcat's restoration to flight finished only last year. It is now operated by the Fagan fighters. The F-7F was also designed as a carrier fighter during the Second World War, but the reality was that it entered service too late to see action. Instead, it saw use as a night fighter and attack aircraft during the Korean War. The F-8F was also slightly too late to see active combat use during the Second World War. It made its combat debut in the hands of the French Air Force during the French-Indochina War in 1946, but is perhaps more famous for being the first aircraft to be used by the Blue Angels. Both the Bearcat and Tiger Cat in this performance came from Lewis Air Legend. There was plenty of modern Navy representation in the flying display too, not least a pair of F-35C Lightning IIs. The F-35C's large folding wings mean the aircraft is limited to 7.5G, rather than the more typical 9 or 10G for modern frontline fighters. 
but perhaps surprisingly, its larger wing area reportedly enables the F-35C to match or even surpass the turn performance of the lighter 9G-capable F-35A. Another two-ship Navy act next, the Growler demonstration team flying two EA-18Gs. The Growler differs from standard Super Hornets in that it has no cannon and no wingtip missile rails. Instead, both locations are used to house electronic warfare and jamming equipment. Underwing hardpoints can be used to carry external fuel tanks, additional jamming pods, and either air-to-air -air or anti-radiation missiles. ship legacy flight with a pair of Corsairs. Now for yet another memorable display by the US Navy, a pairs demonstration by two E-2D Hawkeyes. The E-2 is currently the only fixed-wing carrier-based airborne early warning aircraft in service, with most navies having to rely on land-based or rotary wing assets. This is quite unlike the aggressive and dynamic E-2 solo displays we've seen at air shows last year, and it doesn't show off the aircraft's surprising agility to nearly the same extent. However, the crew intend to up the ante of this new two-ship performance at future shows. An unusual sight at this year's air venture was the presence of multiple large airliners in the flying display. This brand new A330neo from Delta represents one of the very latest Airbus products. Specifically, this is an A330-900, the successor to the 300 variant. It has been fitted with new Trent 7000 engines with double the bypass ratio of their predecessor, A350 style blended wingtips and an optimised high capacity cabin. 
Together, that accounts for a 14% reduction in fuel burn per passenger. The 330neo entered service in 2018, and although orders were slow to begin with, the aircraft has grown in popularity in recent years, not least thanks to its passenger-friendly 242 seating configuration in economy, rather than the more typical 343 cabin found on most other wide bodies. Boeing weren't to be outdone on their home turf, and United demonstrated a 777-300ER. It was a shame not to see Boeing's own re-engined product, the 777X, which had displayed at Farnborough one week earlier. But with the 777X project beset by delays, this is currently the newest variant of the 777 that passengers can actually fly on. First delivered in 2004, it features extended wings and slightly uprated engines to offer a longer range and a higher maximum takeoff weight than the original model. another 777 at the show as well, a 200ER series jet which since June of this year has served as the flying testbed for Boeing's Eco Demonstrator program. As can be seen by the SAF decals on the underside of the fuselage, it can be powered by sustainable aviation fuel one of over 30 tests and trials intended to find ways of making aviation safer and less environmentally damaging. Speaking of which, here is another such idea, electric propulsion, as demonstrated during Air Ventures Innovation Day. This is the Electric Eel, a hybrid electric testbed based on the Cessna 337. Its manufacturers claim that the eel offers a 50 to 70 percent saving in fuel costs and a 25 to 50 percent saving in maintenance costs, transporting up to three passengers over 400 miles. Also electric, the Opener Blackfly, a highly unusual single-seat personal eVTOL aircraft currently undergoing development. The range of the Blackfly is extremely limited, even by the standard of other proposed eVTOL aircraft at just 30 miles. However, with more than 5,000 test flights already completed, the Blackfly is positioned as one of the most mature eVTOL projects. They say the aircraft will go on sale soon for roughly the price of a luxury SUV. Here is something deeply fitting of the Innovation Day theme, the record-breaking Perlin 2 glider. The Perlin 2 is a pressurized experimental research glider designed in the USA by Windward Performance with technical assistance from Airbus.
it was designed to be able to fly as high as 90,000 feet, and while that goal has not yet been achieved, it has set the record for the highest subsonic flight at 76,124 feet, even higher than a U-2. The aircraft is also intended to be used to study the polar vortex and its effect on weather systems. Its Grob 520 tow plane was designed and built in Germany as a high-altitude surveillance aircraft capable of flying at over 50,000 feet. It first flew in 1987, initially aimed at military customers, but those orders fell through and only six have been produced. We've seen aircraft from the US Air Force and Navy, now it's time for the Marine Corps' contribution. A role demonstration by an MV-22B Osprey, initially flying past in airplane configuration, in which mode it has a top speed of some 275 knots, but now showing off its vertical takeoff and landing capabilities in helicopter mode. first Ospreys were delivered to the Marine Corps in 2005, followed by the Air Force in 2006. But it is an exciting time for the Osprey Force. The Navy received its first examples in 2020, and the type will soon fully replace the C2 Greyhound in the carrier onboard delivery role. Marine Corps also dispatched a CH-53 to take part in the static display, seen here departing on the Thursday. As always, Air Venture attracted some of the country's rarest classic aircraft. Here, a replica Howard DGA-6 Mr. Mulligan, a one-of-a-kind 1934 racer designed to compete for the Bendix Trophy. It won that trophy in 1935. This year there were not one but two Howard 500s. In fact, from a production run of 17, these are the only two still flying in the world. This aircraft caused a stir, a Calair Model A2, a two-seat utility aircraft of which just 16 were built back in the 1940s. We've seen Matt Yonkin's Beach 18S at Air Venture countless times before, performing his typically graceful and polished solo aerobatic display, but this year saw something a little different, some two-ship formation passes with a second Beach 18.
The white aircraft was previously owned by Matt Yonkin's father, and he clocked up more than 8,000 flying hours in it. The Beach 18 is, of course, an aircraft with a great deal of military history, and so this aircraft begins our look back at some of the week's most memorable warbird action. This year's air venture included a rather special event with Second World War triple ace Clarence Bud Anderson flying in the back seat of this P-51 in what was billed as his last ever flight in a Mustang. Anderson's aircraft was joined by several other P-51s as well as a P-39 and a Mustang painted in the colours of his personal aircraft, Old Crow. Mustangs also featured in the Warbirds of America segment, representing what was, without doubt, one of the most consequential fighters of the Second World War. There were plenty of other types involved too, however. This formation comprises a Bearcat, Yak-9, Mustang and Corsair. The Corsair was arguably one of the most successful fighters of the entire conflict achieving one of the highest kill ratios of any Allied fighter, and proving to be the dominant fighter aircraft in the Pacific theatre. The Yak-9, meanwhile, doesn't enjoy nearly so much fame, perhaps because it flew on the critical, but often forgotten, Eastern Front. But, at the time, it commanded great respect, faring well against the Luftwaffe and regarded by many of its pilots as being a superior aircraft to the Spitfire and the Mustang. Here, another Corsair is joined by a P-40 and a Sky Raider. There were a great many training and liaison aircraft on show. These bird dogs, known by the military as the L-19 or O-1, were based on the civilian Cessna 170. We saw the electric eel earlier on. This is the military piston engine version, the O-2 Skymaster, which replaced the bird dog in the 1960s. Here are the only two US military observation aircraft of the Second World War that were developed from scratch rather than being based on civilian designs. First up, the Stinson L1F Vigilant. The L1 was designed as America's answer to the Fiesler Storch and had a stall speed of just 31 miles per hour. This is one of only two L1s still flying. Also from Stinson, the L5 Sentinel an aircraft that proved crucial during the invasion of Normandy, scouting ahead of Allied troops to check the status of bridgeheads and railway lines. 
This aircraft is a Ryan Navion, a civilian touring aircraft of the late 1940s. But, like many others, the Navion was also used in military service. Now on to the trainers, and we start with one of the most important of all, the T-6. It is said that the T-6 has trained more pilots to fly than any other aircraft type, from the Second World War up until the 1980s. Here we see five Yak-52s, two-seat versions of the Yak-50 originally designed for use as the official aerobatic training aircraft of the Soviet Union. It has also been used extensively for military training and even light attack. At the rear, three Nanchang CJ-6s, a visually similar aircraft built as a basic trainer for the Chinese People's Liberation Army Air Force. It first flew in 1958, but is still in production and being delivered to military customers today. Here are several Royal Air Force training aircraft. First up, two examples of the DHC-1 Chipmunk. This is the Scottish Aviation Bulldog. It was designed by Beagle as the B-125, with orders from the Swedish Air Force. When Beagle went bust, the rights to the design were taken on by Scottish Aviation, and it was soon ordered by the British military to replace the Chipmunk. These two Bulldogs still wear the distinctive colour scheme of their old civilian owner, the Ultimate High Academy. It's wonderful to see this trio of aircraft now flying in civilian hands. Sakata TB-30 Epsilons recently retired from the French Air Force. The main feature of the transport warbird segment was, as usual, a formation of C-47s and DC-3s, in this case five of them. bombers were mainly represented by B-25 Mitchells, which performed imitation bomb drops accompanied by ground pyrotechnics. But the largest and most impressive vintage bomber at the show was, without doubt, B-29 Superfortress Dock. You will have noticed over the course of this film footage from what is known as the pyro field on the far side of the runway, courtesy of our friends at Tora Tora Tora, who were responsible for rigging and detonating the pyrotechnic effects. And here is the B-29's imitation bomb drop as seen from their perspective.
Jet warbirds are always a large feature of air venture, and a significant number of L-39 albatrosses are always present. Here, two L-39s are joined by a pair of Sci-I S-211s, a privately developed Italian training aircraft designed in the 1970s. The S-211 saw very limited sales success and was never ordered by its native Italy, but the design has since been revived and has been used as the basis for the Italian Air Force's new high-efficiency trainer, the Ermachi M345. It will soon become the mount of their national aerobatic team as well, Frecce Tricolori. Here, three L-39s are trailed by the aircraft they replaced, the L-29 Delphin. And behind them, the first dedicated American jet trainer, the T-33 Shooting Star. Here, an F-86F Sabre joins a MiG-17F. The two aircraft types often appear alongside each other at American air shows, performing mock dogfights, but in reality they are not contemporaries. The Sabre in the Korean War came up against the MiG-17's predecessor, the shorter, stubbier and non-afterburning MiG-15. We'll get a rather better look at the afterburner of the MiG-17 later on as part of the Sunset Show. One of the most memorable displays of Air Venture 2022, and indeed of the entire air show season, was the air show debut of the Polaris Dawn Fleet, including their MiG-29. Polaris Dawn is the brainchild of Draken International's Jared Isaacman, a training tool for civilian would-be astronauts. Seemingly, that involves a large and varied fleet of classic jets, L-39s, Alpha jets and a MiG-29UB. Three of these aircraft types are still very much in service. Indeed, the L-39 is still in production, and the Alpha Jet remains in service with eight military operators as a training aircraft, light attack platform, and as the mount of the French national aerobatic team, the Patrouille de France. The MiG-29 was the Soviet Union's answer to the F-16. It entered service in 1982 and has seen phenomenal export success. The type is currently in service with 23 nations and it has previously flown for at least 10 more. Like the L-39, it is still in production today, now in upgraded form and known as the MiG-35. The MiG-29UB is a two-seat conversion trainer and one of the two original mass production variants of the MiG-29 during the Soviet era. This one was built in 1986, but only has around a thousand flying hours.
The MiG-29's two Klimov RD-33 engines give it an exceptional thrust-to-weight ratio of 1.09 to 1 and a top speed of Mach 2.3. Like many Russian and Soviet jet engines, they are also able to withstand the turbulent airflows induced by tail slides and other post-stall manoeuvres without flaming out. On Saturday and Sunday, the aircraft gave a brief glimpse of its performance with a short solo display. The MiG boasts exceptional manoeuvrability and old-fashioned mechanical control linkages. This, combined with its plentiful power, means that in the hands of the right pilot, it could out-accelerate, out-climb and out-turn most of its contemporaries. This demonstration barely scrapes the surface of the MiG's epic manoeuvrability, but now being one of the few MiG-29s flying in civilian hands and facing an extreme shortage of spare parts, this is an aircraft that needs to be handled gently. Adventure is the main annual gathering of the Experimental Aircraft Association, an organisation that supports the flying and building of recreational aircraft across the United States. As such, it was highly appropriate that this year's show paid tribute to one of the most influential designers of light sport aircraft, Vans Aircraft. The first Vans design, the RV3, was unveiled 50 years ago, in 1972. It was a single-seat aerobatic kit plane based loosely on the Stitz Playboy, another kit plane that had been designed 20 years earlier. Over the decades that followed, the RV3 became the genesis of the single most successful line of kit planes the world has ever seen, with well over 10,000 RVs completed around the world and hundreds if not thousands more currently under construction. These large formation flybys took place during and above a performance by one of the many RV-based aerobatic teams. The Rocky Mountain Renegades announced their retirement from air shows at the end of the 2021 season, but they were revived for air venture this year as a one-off to mark the RV anniversary.
and on the subject of anniversaries, this was the big one, the 75th anniversary of the United States Air Force. AirVenture was earmarked as one of several events at which the USAF would go all out to mark the occasion. The reality come show week was that their participation was not much different to any other year, but that still meant there was plenty of Air Force flying activity to enjoy. That included a demonstration by the C-17 West Coast demo team. With more than 200 examples of the C-17 in US Air Force service, it's the backbone of the USA's heavy lift transport capability and has seen export success to seven other nations as well. This specific example comes from the 446th Airlift Wing at McCord Air Force Base in Washington State. Also making several flybys, the backbone of the tanker transport fleet, the KC-135R Strato tanker. The KC-135 has been in service since 1957, and all of the remaining examples are upgraded R models, which have been fitted with CFM-56 high-bypass turbofans. The oldest Strato tankers are now in the process of being replaced by the KC-46, which we'll see later on. competition to choose a successor for the rest of the fleet is currently underway, with the KC-46 facing off against the Airbus A330 based LMXT. We saw the Perlin 2 earlier in the programme, which achieved the highest subsonic flight in 2018. This is the aircraft type that had previously set that record in 1989, the U-2 Dragon Lady. Unfortunately, U-2 pilots don't get enough flight hours on their aircraft to maintain full currency, so T-38As painted in a U-2-style paint scheme are used as companion trainers. This allows U-2 pilots to practice basic airmanship when not in the U-2 itself. This specific example comes from the 9th Reconnaissance Wing at Beale AFB in California. Another T-38A now, this time from the 1st Fighter Wing at Langley AFB, Virginia. Langley's talons are used for red air duties, while most of Langley's T-38s are painted black to make them easier to spot, this one wears a blue aggressor paint scheme.
providing some enjoyable fly past as they arrived for the show this year was a pair of F-15C Eagles from the 159th Fighter Wing from Naval Air Station New Orleans. The F-15C is currently being phased out of US Air Force service, being replaced by the F-35A and soon the F-15EX. The type was withdrawn from European operations this year, and its operations are also winding down in Japan and much of the continental United States. The last examples are expected to be retired sometime around 2025. We saw the F-35 demo team arriving with a trio of P-51s at the start of the programme. Here is their four-ship heritage flight performance. Due to the limited size of the aerobatic box at AirVenture, the F-35 cannot perform its full aerobatic demonstration, and is instead limited to a non-aerobatic mini-demo. That mini-demonstration was performed during the day, and perhaps more excitingly, as part of the Sunset Air Displays, the afterburner from the jet's F-135 engine standing out well against the darkening sky. Producing 43,000 pounds of thrust, the F-135 is one of the most powerful engines ever applied to a frontline fighter. To put that into perspective, a Block 50 F-16 produces less than 30,000 pounds of thrust, only around two-thirds that of the F-35. That being said, the F-35 is considerably heavier and has a higher drag design, limiting the aircraft to a relatively modest top speed of Mach 1.6. We're about to see an excellent demonstration of the F-35's exceptional high angle of attack performance. The aircraft is limited by the flight control software to 50 degrees of alpha. High angles of attack can even be achieved in controlled level flight to a greater extent than virtually any other non-thrust vectoring fighter. The Sunset Show included a very different kind of heritage flight featuring the F-35, one of the Mustangs and an AD-1 Sky Raider.
Also returning for the sunset show was the two-ship growler demonstration we saw earlier on, accompanied this time by pyrotechnics. Like the F-35, this is another aircraft with exceptional high alpha performance, capable of producing lift at 50 degrees of alpha and remaining controllable at up to 70 degrees of alpha in certain circumstances. The F-35Cs also performs their demonstration at sunset before one F-35 and one Growler joined up for another legacy flight. Like the F-35 Heritage flight, this legacy flight is also led by a Sky Raider. In this case, a two-seat EA-1E airborne early warning variant. One of the most memorable Warbird solo displays at this year's show was Bernie Vasquez in the Sea Fury FB-11. The Sea Fury was one of the fastest single-engine piston fighters ever built, originally designed as a land-based fighter for the Royal Air Force and based on the Hawker Tempest. In 1944, with the end of the Second World War now an inevitability, the RAF cancelled their order, but the development of a navalised version continued for the Royal Navy Fleet Air Arm. The Sea Fury was competitive against early jets and proved popular among pilots during the Korean War. But perhaps the most consequential chapter in its history came in 1961, when a tiny fleet of three Sea Furies, two T-33s and one B-26 successfully saw off an attempted American orchestrated invasion in Cuba, shooting down two CIA aircraft and sinking two ships in the process. Always a standout act at any sunset show is Randy Ball's MiG-17F. Although produced in huge numbers and operated by dozens of nations, the MiG-17 is best remembered today for its role in the Vietnam War. Despite being outdated and far slower than many other fighters in that conflict, MiG-17s were used to great effect, proving to be among the most nimble and agile fighters of the era. They were often used in concert with faster but less manoeuvrable MiG-21s. The MiG-21s would chase down American formations from behind, only for the MiG-17s to ambush them from head on. In the ensuing chaos, the MiG-17s would aim to disrupt the mission as much as possible, breaking up the formation forcing the American jets to let loose their weapons early, or even, on several occasions, scoring air-to-air -air kills, before quickly disengaging and disappearing before the American fleet could retaliate. We can't cover the sunset shows without showing Nate Hammond of Ghost Rider Air Shows performing his stunning pyrotechnic display in a DHC-1 Super Chipmunk. This aircraft has racks on the wingtip to which various types of pyrotechnic effect can be attached, connected to an electrical system with E-matches. 
That electrical system is controlled from the cockpit, allowing the pilot to deliver a small charge to those E-matches and, in doing so, igniting the fireworks. This year, his display took place at the same time as Air Venture's traditional ground-launched fireworks show. We'll end our look back at AirVenture with a series of departures, and here we see a special scheme A-10 Thunderbolt II of the 122nd Fighter Wing in a commemorative Black Snake scheme marking 100 years of the Indiana National Guard. Here, the departure of one of the Louisiana National Guard F-15Cs we saw earlier, leaving the show with an impressive unrestricted climb. This is the successor to many of the US Air Force's KC-135s, the KC-46A Pegasus. Based on the Boeing 767, the type entered service in 2019. Here are a pair of Heritage Schemes T-6 Texan IIs from the 89th Flight Training Squadron at Shepard Air Force Base. Finally, the departure of the C-5M Galaxy, which turned to overfly the airfield shortly after takeoff. That brings us to the end of this year's Air Venture Roundup. If you want to see more of any of the individual performances without added narration, then you can find longer videos of most of them on the Airshow Stuff YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this style of film, then visit the This Is Flight channel, where you can find dozens more like it from airshows around the world. This year, This Is Flight covered nine airshows in this style, spanning the USA, UK, France and Australia. Look out for another collaboration between Airshow staff and This Is Flight coming very soon. Airshow Action 2022 will bring you the very best warbird and military air display highlights from around the world this year. From the 75th anniversary celebration of the first supersonic flight at Edwards, to the combined arms demonstration at Nellis, the European tour of the Black Eagles, huge warbird balbos in Australia, and tributes to the Normandy Yemen in France. We'll see you again then. And of course, we'll be back at AirVenture in 2023.